Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. It is a beautiful Thursday. Actually, it's not beautiful. It's been raining all day, but it's a Thursday, and it's awesome. Glad to be here. And we are rejoined by a friend of the podcast, Sam Fortier. But before we get into the, the interview with Sam, just want to say the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network, and you can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. But Sam... Uh, I got to talk to you first off because big news happened on Tuesday. Washington released Scott Turner of his duties as offensive coordinator. Obviously, a couple weeks ago, you came out with an article in the Washington Post detailing some anonymous player quotes talking about Scott Turner. So what was your reaction to that? Because I'll tell you, I was surprised. Yeah, I I was not surprised just because I think after the Cleveland game, you know, I walked into the locker room and I had a conversation with a, a veteran player. And I said, basically, you know, Ron Rivera was looking for a spark in this game and you guys didn't have it. Why is that? And, and the veteran said, ask the play caller. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, ask the play caller. And I said, you know, I, we tried to get more specific, but the player decided, you know, he was he, he didn't want to talk anymore. So so he left. But then when you start going around the locker room, you know, later, actually in that same uh, Post game locker room, Logan Thomas in a, in a scrum of reporters was asked, Hey, what'd you think of the play calling? And he said, You know, all I'm going to say is we should be scoring more points. We have more talent to be scoring more points. And, you know, over the next week, you know, when I start talking to players in the locker room, ultimately, you know, that veteran that night, Logan, uh, and, and ultimately 11 players expressed, you know, discontent and frustration uh, with Scott Turner's play calling. So anytime you have, I mean, 11 is the number of players that are on offense guys. Like yeah, anytime right. you have that volume of guys who are frustrated with a coach, it can't be a surprise when the head coach decides to move on. Right. Before Hall goes, just name the other 10. All right. I told you. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate the efforts, but uh, you know, when, when uh, it's the old trap you got there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll right, get just it. drop the first letter of his first name. We'll just guess yeah. the rest. And his last name. Or say something that it rhymes with. Do it in Morse <laughs> code. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, over the past couple of years, obviously, we've seen this team um loves to go out and get a veteran quarterback that's been, if you want to say, discarded from his original team. And there's another guy out there now that has played at a pretty high level over his career, over his nine-year career in Derek Carr. He's leaving the Las Vegas Raiders, and – a lot of the chatter has been on one side of the table. Uh, just go with Sam Howell and see if he can be the guy. If not, you know, maybe you get a top five, top ten pick. You get another quarterback that in 2024. Or there's another side of the table where it's like, hey, go out and get a guy like Derek Carr and see if I see if he can maximize his talent on the offense and build up the offensive line, of course, as well. What would you do? What would you think this team is going to do, and what would you do? That's a good question, and I think that – Derek Carr and the level that he plays at, unquestionably, he would be, I think, the most talented quarterback uh, that Ron Rivera would have. That would be his ninth different starter. And unquestionably, I mean, Carson Wentz was the most, is the most talented quarterback who's taken a snap here, in my opinion, even though, you know, he obviously had his struggles. The caliber of arm that he has is just different. And so if you're talking about purely from a football standpoint, I think this team could benefit from having Derek Carr on it. Now, with Derek Carr's contract, with his no trade clause, what are the and, and the assets you gave up to get Carson Wentz? Are you willing to go out and trade for another veteran quarterback? I would imagine that the commanders are not willing to part with, you know, some valuable draft picks as they did a year ago. But as we saw some reporting out of Las Vegas this morning, I imagine that Derek Carr would want to be released because if he is released, uh, then he could have, you know, 31 NFL teams bidding on his services. Obviously not that many because you'd have to factor out people that already have teams. But he would have, let's say, between six and ten teams saying, hey, like, what do you want? We're willing to give it to you. You have competition. The price is going to go up. So at that point, I think Washington could be interested. Hmm. Now, where does the average per year, where does the total value shake out? What ultimately is the cost of Derek Carr? I think it would be dependent – um, on their interest because you got to start figuring out other contracts. Are you going to pay Deron Payne, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is the length of the contract? But 
If Derek Carr is a free agent, I would expect Washington to be interested up to a certain point, and it's really too early to tell where things would be at. Yeah, the one thing that Derek Carr did say today actually was that uh he's looking for stability. He's looking for stability. He's looking for ownership from the top to bottom. So one of those things where it's like, well, you know, we got some things, I guess. I <laughs> but uh, but so going back to the offensive coordinator position, we've heard a lot of rumors. I mean, there's almost basically like an all star list out there. It's like, oh, well, I heard Eric B. Enemy. I heard Greg Roman possibly. I heard you know, it's like these things. I heard that they're going to hire from within with Zampese. What do you think they ultimately do? And uh, who are some other possible candidates for this job? That's a really good question because I know that's what, you know, I asked you, I saved it for you. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's, it's tough, right? Because on one hand, you do have a lot of skill talent. You're, you're probably a quarterback and, and some offensive line, re, you know, uh, rebuilding away from having a pretty good offensive unit. But at the same time, if you're coming in with a lame duck coaching staff, you're coming in where there's going to be a new owner and there could be changes. This guy's on, on a short leash. It would have to be someone, I think, who would either be internal if, if you're Ken Zampezi, you're, you know, you can step up and take that job. Uh, or it would have to be someone who says, Hey, I'm going to bet on myself right now. I've been a position coach for a while. I want that next opportunity. And if I can come in and let's say the quarterback position isn't great or the line isn't great, I can still show my capabilities as a coach, learn on the job. And if I get fired, that's okay. Um, so, so for me, like Eric B doesn't necessarily, I mean, you know, it's possible that he's on the table, but like, it wouldn't make sense to me because right. He's been the offensive coordinator at a very high profile, very successful offense. And really, if you're him, like I'm only leaving for a promotion. I don't know the specifics of right. his situation, but like that would be my thinking. You know, I think a guy like Deuce Staley fits the yeah. the the you know profile that I just mentioned. Mark Brunell, too. Mark Brunell did wonders in Detroit with Jared Goff. Yeah, Mark Brunell could could be a guy on that list. Um you know, I think you could, I mean, because it's Ron Rivera, you always have to evaluate like whose guys he's had in his past. Who's Rob in Carolina. Krasinski, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is a guy that he's worked with before. He's a special assistant at Boston college now. Um, you know, I, I think it's possible that, that Martin Mayhew could dip into the San Francisco connection. I mean, there's a lot of different ways this thing could shake out. And um, from my understanding, you know, I think the coaches are off for a long weekend and, um, you know, I think I think they'll probably hit it hard coming back next week. Yeah, and I agree with you. Uh, one player that was instrumental and critical to this team's success this season, well, success or lack thereof, you could say, was Taylor Heineke, and he had an Instagram post that he posted, it was kind of a thank you, meaning uh, looking at it from a fan perspective, that's a good buy. So in your opinion, do you think that Taylor Heineke walks? Now, if he does, what do you think they do at quarterback? So there's a lot of moving parts here. And I think you got to start with Taylor Heineke was brought in as the COVID QB primarily because he knew Scott Turner's system so well, and he was a plug and play guy. Now you've taken, you know, you fired Scott Turner's system. Do you still value his contributions? I think that Taylor at this stage of his career, he knows a lot of offense. He's been around the league a ton. It's he's not just a Scott Turner guy. I think he adds value. He's a, he's a great backup on a certain formula, but has he played himself over the last two years into a bigger payday than you're willing to pay for your number two quarterback? And if, you know, like if his market is the Colt McCoy market, you know, in Arizona, when they wanted to back up Kyler, if it's, if it's a top end backup and you're facing a salary cap crunch, cause you want to keep four defensive linemen or you want to pay cam curl is QB two a position that you're willing to, to sacrifice on and take a, a lesser value of, um, another question is if you do go get a Derek Carr, if you do go get a veteran quarterback, or if you draft one, you're going to have Sam Howell as your, as your quarterback, because he's on a rookie deal. Then do you say, okay, we're not paying Taylor Heineke to be number three. I know this is like kind of all over the place, but like, there are just a ton of factors to consider here. Um, right now, because Ron has been very emphatic that they're not going to just stick with Sam, that they're going to explore all their options, whether it be trade, draft, free agency, et cetera, to get into the quarterback. Right now, if you know, if I'm putting 100 chips down, I'm probably putting like 65 chips on Taylor Heineke being somewhere else in 2023, mm -hmm. but that could obviously change. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, he definitely paid or played himself into a, a payday for like his standards, I guess is like backup quarterback standards. So wouldn't be surprised if someone offers him some money to come in and be like a mentor to a younger guy. But um, one guy that was instrumental to this defense this year is Cam Curl. And I know Ron was asked the other day in his press conference about his contract situation. And 
if he's in their long-term future and they're in their plans and he did his usual, like he doesn't want to give any leverage type of thing to his agent. So my question is everyone loves Cam Curl. Uh, you can see the defense is dramatically one way or the other with him or with him not in the lineup. Do you think he's going to be in their long-term plans? The first thing I got to say is like, it's always funny to me when Ron says like, I can't answer this honestly because I'm giving the agent leverage. Cause like that answer gives the agent leverage. And like, <laughs> and like, even, even if, you didn't want to give the agent leverage. Like, I think everybody knows what it is with Cam Curl. Like, if I'm the agent, I just, like, sit down and I'm like, okay, like, here's a piece of paper that shows, like, your performance with Cam Curl and without Cam. Beginning, beginning of the season, end of the season. Like, there's no discussion after that. You know what I mean? Like, everybody knows what it is. Um, Do I think he's in their long-term plans? <sighs> I hate to give you guys so many, like, qualified, like, you know, con like, nuanced answers, but, like, do they pay Deron Payne? Because if you pay Deron Payne, like, and and Montez is coming up and Chase is coming up and you have Defoe and you have some of these other guys who are versatile, you have Bobby McCain, like, can you afford to pay Cam Curl? Because Cam Curl, to me, is, is a top five safety in the NFL and is, like, going to command a market like that. You know, like, he probably doesn't have the ceiling of, of a Derwin James, uh, but, like, I think that he is really, really freaking good. Um, and so like, at, at what point do you just say, Hey, we're paying too many guys? I, I don't know. Mm. Um, but I, from a pure, a pure football perspective, yes, I think he should be in their long-term plans. And, and I think that, uh, you know, he would be an instrumental piece of this defense moving forward. Right. Well, we, we touched on quarterback and, and speaking of plans going forward, what are your top three positions to focus on outside of quarterback this off season? And who were the uh, nine players that you yeah. spoke to in the locker room? <laughs> yeah. the, the top three positions for Give me, us eight in, of them. <laughs> in the, the top three positions for me in no order are probably offensive line, offensive line and offensive line. <laughs> uh, because I think center position, you know, one of the Ron Rivera and Martin Mayhew were, notably low key, notably conservative. I think in the end of season presser, usually, you know, you've heard Ron just kind of say what it is and kind of keep it, you know, keep it a buck with people like, Hey, year three, we got to take a step year two. You know, we got to not, uh, we got to not let the success we had in year one, you know, getting into that playoff game affect us. He's always like kind of stated what it is. He was very, very conservative this time. And, um, but the only time you really saw him kind of tip his hand is when you know, he started talking about center. They've had a ton of injuries. They have a ton of turnover. And he was like, we have to get younger at that position. So I know you just gave Chase Roulier a big deal, but two season ending He's injuries in a row played, right. at, at his, at his age and at his experience, like and his maybe move on from him. Yeah. I mean, it's possible, but also like one of the biggest indictments to me in, in that article that I wrote about Scott Turner and the frustration with the play calling, like the frustration with the play calling, especially if it's from 11 guys in the locker room, that's totally legitimate. Like that is a problem you have to address. But I think if you're Scott Turner, you can point to like, when have I had a legitimate NFL quarterback to work with? And then the third component to that is this year I had probably the worst offensive, you know, one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like when you're running vertical pass concepts and you have to keep two chippers in, so you have three receiving routes for the first two and a half seconds of a play, like – you know, okay, like Carson Wentz took a sack, but like he didn't have a check down because I have to compensate for the front office not building me a good offensive line. Like that's, I'm just talking from his perspective, what I would imagine his perspective would be. So I think that the offensive line has to get rebuilt. And I think that Charles Leno, even though, you know, he owned in the locker room, he said, I did not play up to my standards this year. He has to be better. Um, Sam Cosme, the rotation is super weird, but like if you think he's going to be a tackle, like you showed in week 18, yeah. all right, like you got your tackles you need to address the middle because Andrew Norwell and Trey Turner in drop back blocking and getting out in space and some of those outside zone runs that they've done in your, it, like that they've been very successful with Antonio Gibson in the past. Like that was not it. So if you're remaking the entire interior of your line, uh, that's a, a hugely important thing, probably a, one notch below quarterback um, on defense. It looks like, you know, if, if you can get Cole Holcomb on a good deal, like, uh, him and Jamin Davis, like that pairing seems like it'll be okay. I think you have corners. You could probably use more depth there, but like safety and defensive line, you're good. So to me, offensive line, offensive line, offensive line is where yeah. you got to go. <laughs> My man. And Jamin Davis uh, uh, had a great year, uh, led the team in tackles with 104. 
And obviously Cam Curl was in the 80s and still missed, I think, like six games or something like that, which is absolutely insane. My next question for you, it's a two-parter, but it's based on percentages. So one of the theories that's been brought out there is that the Bears are looking to possibly trade the first overall, or maybe even move Justin Fields. So in your opinion, the percentage chance that Washington is interested in trading with the Bears for Justin Fields. And then the second part of that, Chris Harris's interview with the Titans, percentage chance that he's going to leave. I have not talked to Chris Harris about that job, so it's hard for me to put a percentage on it. But like that dude is seen as a, a rising defensive star coach in this league. You know, he's interviewed for for DC jobs before. Um, I think everybody has seen what he has done with the secondary, um, particularly, you know, this year after, you know, rebounding from the last year. Because I think last year, I think the underperformance in 2021 was primarily on the defensive line and their undisciplined play. I mean, you can't cover dudes for four seconds um, normally. So I, I would say that. I mean, Chris Harris, whether it be this year, whether it be next year, whether promotion or, or you know, a, a theoretically lateral move, um, I would imagine that that he would be a coach in demand. And, and if he sees, like, if he thinks to himself, there's going to be a new owner, Ron might get fired after next year, like, I need to go find a better situation. Like, I could I could see that happening. That that seems very logical to me. Um what was what was the first part of your question? The just uh, it's been theorized by fans and that the Bears could possibly be looking oh, to Justin Fields. Justin Fields. Yeah. Um. I mean, like it's possible, but the strategy of hey, let's take the guy that like a team had in their building for one or two years or more that were like, no, nah, we're good on this guy. Like going and getting <laughs> that guy and betting your season on him, like it's just a, such an uninspiring approach to me. Like, mm-hmm. like last year when they went through the Jimmy Garoppolo discussions it like, or if he were to end up here this year, like, like, cool. You know, like, mm. like what, like what ceiling is that? You know, yeah. uh, I hate to be dismissive of like dudes who I, I know are talented at their jobs, but like that just, it does, it does not move the needle for me. Like Justin Fields, like the thing that always stands out to me is like when, when Washington won in Chicago on Thursday night, and Benjamin St. Juice had that great PBU against Darnell Mooney in the end zone. Like I went up to Benjamin in the locker room after I was like, Hey, like, take me through that play. Like, do you know, you're getting a fade there? Do you know, like, like, like take me through it. And he was like, okay, all game. We knew that if we could like jam Justin Fields, first read, he couldn't get to his second read and he had a hard time processing these defenses and he was going to try to take off. And obviously it almost hurt him at the end because Justin Fields got out of the pocket and like had that 40 yard run. But he was like, I knew in that situation, he's going to Mooney. And I knew based on his alignment, like he's probably throwing a fade and I need to like position myself in, in a certain way. And when to me, like that just sticks out because like that's year two yeah. of a dude yeah. in an NFL system. And like Justin Fields is a great arm and he's a great athlete. And I think like he knows ball, but like when a defensive player is saying, if we take away your first read, like you're screwed. I'm, I'm not trying to invest in that dude's future. Yeah, right. See, that's why I like. That's why I asked you the question, Sam. <laughs> no, it's funny you even you say that because the fan base is always like, "Oh, we don't want another team's quarterback that's been kicked out the building and discarded, and like another team's trash." But if they got Justin Fields, I guarantee the fan base would go crazy. But like you just said, it's kind of like, did you really want to tie your wagon to a guy that just got released after two years, but or traded after two years? But um. My question is, oh, going back to the press conference the other day with um, Ron Rivera and Martin Mayhew, um, Twitter was in a frenzy because of the whole um, we want to be a two to one pass or run to pass um, ratio philosophy team. Um, A, do you really think that they believe that? And two, do you think that they can win with that with a guy like Sam Howell and if they, with a built out team around a guy like Sam Howell? Uh, I, do, I don't know if you read my article, but I actually wrote an article and the headline was like, do they actually want to be a run first team? Cause I think the two to one ratio, like, do you want to be run, run pass? I think like, no, he, he said that, but I don't think that he actually meant that. Like, I think he just meant we want to be a run first team. We want to follow the Heineke formula that we use to like upset Philly and like kind of go on that run. Um, the, do they actually want to do that has been a question that I have been asking myself for the last two days. Like, do they, do they really mean it? And I think that if you're talking to Ron Rivera, if you're talking to Martin Mayhew, like the answer might be yes. Like we want to be a run dominant team that 
like harkens back to like 30 years ago and like wins in that fashion. And I think that in certain situations, like, like uh, the problem with that, with that formula is like the margin of error gets so small, right? Yeah, yeah. It shortens games. You got to sustain drives, which are hard to do. You got to hit explosive plays, which Washington like has the skill set to do, but like they didn't have a quarterback that could get their three best players on offense, the ball consistently enough where they could hit those explosive plays. And you got to finish in the red zone, which they also were not good at. So, like, I can see an avenue where if you get a competent NFL quarterback, like, who can hit tight window throws in the red zone, like, that looks better than it did this year. But over a large sample size, over a 17-game season, like, is that is that an approach that you really want to double down? I mean, maybe. Like, Ron Rivera, you know, playing with the Bears, uh, having the two-back system in Carolina, like, and a quarterback that, works, that could but run. It, right. But in Carolina, it worked because you had the league MVP at quarterback, in right. my opinion. Yeah. Um, and you forced teams to respect him as a thrower. Uh so do they actually want to do it? Maybe. But like it also would run counter to their roster building of of re-signing Terry McLaurin, signing Curtis Samuel, you know, trading back and, and getting Jahan Dotson. Like uh I, I think that w- what I'm trying to say here, like, obviously, as you guys can tell, like, I've been trying to process this because it like <laughs> their moves and their words like don't align. Mm. But uh, I think that they might actually want to do it. Um, but I, I don't know how wise of a, of a decision that would be. The one thing, the way that I kind of perceived it was more so of them kind of saying what they wanted their identity to be this year because it seemed like that was the approach because the offensive line could not hold up enough for the quarterback that they had to be run heavy in order to have enough time to throw the football off play action. I, I, like you said, the roster building doesn't seem that way. And that's why to me, it almost seems like they're, they were trying to explain the season and why they did what they did and why maybe they were justifying why they let go of Scott basically saying this was what we wanted to do. And they kind of went away with that, but that's just how I looked at it. Sorry. And I think another important component of this is like, to me, uh, that is how they had to play this way this year because of like the offensive line, right? Like if you, if those guys were really good at like running duo and if you're going to run downhill, like they could do that. And that's what you had to do. But for me, I almost wondered like, because 2021, you certainly set it up a certain way. You got Carson because of his arm. You wanted to throw the ball more, like right. look at early season. Um, but if you're not confident that you can go out and get a quarterback that would allow you to do that, if you can't get a Derek Carr or a guy that allows you to throw a little bit more, maybe you say, okay, like we have to, we are going to be forced to rely on this model again next year. And if you say that in the presser, you're setting up, oh, like we're making these moves because we want to embrace this identity rather than we are not capable of getting a quarterback that would allow us to have an, our identity be anything different. That's a good point. Yeah, very, very right. good point. Well, Sam, if you could for me, if you could either take out your crystal ball or smoke your DMT, whatever you got to do to get in the mood to see into the future, uh, who are some possible veterans that could be cap or that could be roster casualties this coming up? Um, well, I think we already talked about one. It could be Chase Roulier yeah. just because of his health and, and the way things have gone. But, um, I mean, as of for right now, I mean, it's it's a little early for me to like get into the the budget things right. i would say chase really is probably probably number one and i think you could see like some other uh you know i think logan you could thomas see logan thomas definitely you know he was not the same this year and you know i know his wife came out on on instagram and was criticizing the lack of red zone targets but told you I guys yeah. yeah i don't know if um <laughs> if uh that if he well could be received. here i think i think you could get a little bit of cap space because um, it, it seems like this this JD McKissick neck injury is very serious. Uh, yeah. I can see a, a retirement. Um, you know, Carson is probably either obviously going to be cut or or retire. Um, but I think those are like the moves that stick out to me right now. Yeah, oh, I love that. Now to wrap this up, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you. But let's review the season. Who's getting your MVP for the Commanders this season? Offensive Rookie of the Year, Defensive Rookie of the Year. The MVP of the year, it's really hard. I know the MVP, like, uh, is – is uh, It's hard for this team this year, especially a quarterback because, like, driven it's so award, many but, like, but I think it has to be Taylor Heineke. Like, That's he, what, he – They didn't go on that – they don't go on that winning streak without him. Right. Right. They don't salvage the season without that guy. Martin Mayhew literally said, you know, he salvaged our season. Like, yes, it's disappointing you didn't make the playoffs, but, like, 
you would not have even been in contention without Taylor Heineke. And also just like, uh, you know, a quick, a quick aside, like this is not something that I think probably fans care about, but like to have a dude like that who gets benched at the end of the year and is, and is as accessible and as revealing and like, is as willing to talk shop all the time and you could take anything to him and he was willing to explain it. Like he was, he was really, you know, I think um, good to the media as well. Uh, But I think just, even if you're talking about on the field contribution, like that dude, uh, you know, saved their season as far as offensive rookie of the year. I I mean, it's hard not to say, I mean, that's a real, that's a two man award between Jahan and and Brian Robinson. Um, I think you could probably argue Brian Robinson because of the formula they used, but man, like Jahan Dotson had some just incredible moments like that spin move for the touchdown. Uh, Seven touchdowns on the year. He had some game winners too against Jacksonville week one. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, it's a, that's a two minute race between either of them. That that's really close. A defensive rookie of the year. I know he wasn't technically a rookie, but uh, Derek Forrest, the development that he made, like, and, and really being an impact player this year. Nobody I mean, saw that coming. No. And, and I think that like he, he allowed them to play that three safety set that they did with Landon in 2021, but like way better. Um, and like when you could like Cam Curl is kind of the key to all that, because like when he could fit the run, like he does, and when he could line up at nickel and, you know, will and, and strong, like in, in just like bouncing around every other play, like that frees up Defoe to be, to, to be deep. But I mean, those guys, I think Defoe is probably probably that dude. I mean, Benjamin St. Juice emerging as a as a legitimate potential CB one is huge. And the other guy I would say, and I know people have talked about him, but like Defoe's emergence was like you know pretty unexpected. I think even to the coaching staff. But like what Jeremy Reeves became this year was yeah. stunning, like to everyone. Um, and I mean, obviously everybody saw like the video of him being named the like the Pro Bowl starter, but like. What a what a remarkable yeah. story that was. Nobody deserves that more than him. Hey, weren't you the one that told us about all pro Revo when he told he said something <laughs> to you about that in the locker room, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember we were we were in Indianapolis and I was like, Wow, you know, crazy finisher or something like that. And he was just like all pro Revo on his mm-hmm. walkout. So it was, you know, that was the that was, he really spoke that into existence. He yeah, did. Yeah. Hey, look, man, if you want what you want, go out and hard work for, you know, and that's exactly what he did. Yeah. Please give us a new host. Please give us a new host. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Sam, my last question for you. Um, A lot of speculation has been around Ron Rivera, um, possibly maybe hiring a GM of this sort because a lot of fan base has been complaining or about his future altogether. Maybe that a new owner does come around in the offseason. I know kind of it's hard for you with you working for the Washington Post, possibly conflict of interest. I don't really care about that. In your opinion, (laughs) what do you think about Rivera's um, future? Do you think? Do you see any move in that sense? I guess I'm I'm unfamiliar with the speculation. Like, can you elaborate on it a little more? They they want him to hire a GM, like other than Martin. Yeah. So basically, they want somebody to be able to have the final say on the player acquisitions. They are questioning Ron Rivera's decision making and personnel department. Gotcha. So it would be like like would he fire Martin in that scenario, or would he just hire like another? I think it'd be person. like more like fire himself as right. like the person, like player personnel guy. And just let Martin Mayhew handle it, I guess, like is what they want. I would have a hard time seeing Ron ever firing himself. Um, <laughs> could he take a step back and say, like, hey, I'm going to let the guys that I handpick? Like, I don't know if that's even possible. Like, because once you hire two dudes, like Marty Herney is obviously instrumental in, you know, the EVP of football ops. Like, right. um, he's instrumental in that front office as well. It's really like the brain trust is, is Marty Herney, Martin Mayhew, and Ron, obviously with Ron having the final decision-making power. And I don't know if you can like divest the final decision-making power once you've hired the two dudes that are in the room with you. But I also don't see Ron firing either of those guys. And I mean, Dan Snyder wasn't at the last game and, and all signs point to him selling. So I doubt that he would force that upon Ron, um, particularly because like firing guys, especially at, you know, at Scott Turner's level, it's okay. But at Ron Rivera's level at Martin and Marty, like that's a, you know, significant buyout. So all of this is to say, like, I'm not, you know, having heard this for the first time, like it would be very hard for me to imagine substantiative front office personnel changes this year but 
if a new owner comes in, is Ron Rivera in a lame duck, you know, limbo position? Yeah, I think that is totally on the table. Okay. Well, you speak, Kyle. You knew what I meant, and you answered it perfectly. Sam. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for joining us this evening, as always. I'm glad we could get it done. Really good job on the uh, piece that you came out with uh, in all your hard work over the season, joining us, giving us updates. You, did, you guys did a great job this season in the media room. I appreciate all your time, as always, Sam. But before you get out of here, would you like to plug your social media handle, just in case anybody watching would like to come follow you on Twitter and, and see your work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Twitter, I'm at Sam Four Tr S A M, the number four T R. You can find me in the Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com, uh, with my colleague Nikki Jabala. Yeah, oh, I can't believe Curtis Samuel said that to you. Okay. <laughs> right? Right? Hey, Reed. One thing that uh, that I feel like nobody can say that you're not is uh, relentless, dogged. Thank you. I That's respect what I've been it. I respect thank you. It. Yeah, yeah. No, well, thank, thank you. you. And yeah. I think that. Um, uh, somebody like Samuel Cosme probably says something like that too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, have a good night, brother. It was a pleasure as always. Of course. Always love being on with y'all. Thanks so much. All right, thank brother. you, Sam. My man, my man, Sam, dude. Why do you do that? You just always <laughs> what make I it do? But it is funny because we talked about it beforehand and you totally said you were going to do that. Yeah, I told him. I told him straight up. I was like, I hope you have an iron trap going on, dog, because I'm getting this answer out of you. And I mean, I think uh, he only name dropped a few guys, but I think he was leaving us a trail of breadcrumbs. I think those are all the guys. So if we go back and listen, we can figure well, it out. We can already probably guarantee probably one of them was probably Curtis Samuel. If you just look at his usage in the first half of the season and the right. second half of the season, I'd probably be pissed off, too. So I'm going <laughs> to guess he's probably one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd be That's willing a to valid bet point. it wasn't one of the offensive linemen. I think we can. I know. <laughs> yeah. So it was, lot, was, okay? was the first. <laughs> yeah. that many, you kind of know what's good. But that being said, guys, let's move on to our fan questions. And we have this from the Colonel. He said, gentlemen, I have a few takeaways on the season. Would like your opinion on them. I'll only list the first here. Quarterback, obviously, in urgent need. Veteran, highly, tra- uh, highly valued college draft pick or trade. Most likely course of action. So do you think that they're going to go after a veteran, a highly valued college draft pick, or a trade like a Justin Fields type of thing? What do you think is most likely to happen, Hall? Um, Trade. What was it? Trade, veteran, or what else? Draft pick. Draft pick. Uh, I'd probably say they're going to – I wouldn't even say like a high-priced veteran unless – the only way I can see them going after a high-priced veteran would be if a guy Mars like Derek Carr doesn't get traded before the uh, February 15th deadline, then he gets released, and then he'd be, like Sam was talking about, on the open market, and then you can kind of just work out the numbers and see what he wants overall. Now, that would probably be the only way I see them really uh, like swinging for the fences, if you want to call it that again, because they tried to do that with Carson Wentz. They tried to do that with uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Didn't work out the past couple of years. So that would probably be uh, – where I would think they would go to. I think a lot of it depends on what happens with Carson. Obviously, we just heard from Sam. I think that most likely he Taylor, Taylor won't be returning. Um, so what do you do with a veteran backup in that sense, looking at it from Sam Howe starting from here on out? Um, so if I was going to say anything, I think the cheapest option is probably the most likely one, just given the kind of history with Ron Rivera. So if that sense, I'm going to say a draft pick, because maybe this is a, a kind of draft where it's a lot like last year where you don't have to mortgage a one through three, a top three pick in order to get a quarterback that actually has some talent and could produce for you in a backup role. So I would say most likely it would be through the draft. Yeah, and I I still think that there's a chance. I mean, look, a lot has to happen, but the top three quarterbacks in this draft, really the top four, I mean, because you got to include Anthony Richardson just in terms of skill set. I think that they're all very intriguing and it would be very easy for a team to fall in love with them. Like, I think that they would really – uh, be attracted towards somebody like a Will Levis, CJ Stroud. Um, I think that they would like Bryce Young, but I don't think they would be willing to trade up and mortgage the future. So it really depends, but I'm, I'm just going to be, I'm going to say that they're going to go and they're going to try to get one of these stud rookie quarterbacks. I don't, I don't know what else they can do. I, I don't think that they're really going to go the trade route for a veteran. I don't think that they really want to sign one unless it's a mid tier guy. And I don't think you can really afford to do that again, someone unless they really think how's it. I'm Someone praying. threw Jacoby Jacoby Brissett out there as like a backup to Sam Howe or like that's not a bad. I would yeah. love that to I, battle you know, with uh, Sam Howe and like you love Jacoby Brissett. Look, I love Jacoby. 
I don't like not like him, but yeah. you know he's 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 average. So well, I, I mean, like, hate yeah. so like with Jacoby as a backup, you would he can he be a serviceable backup for That's you? That's what I'm saying. It'd be like a Taylor Heineke situation, right? Like, and right. what did he do for Cleveland this year? I think he did a pretty damn good job given the circumstances of what happened. Obviously, I think he, he actually had, had the same numbers as Taylor Heineke to be honest with you. Well, so. and also they had a run, the rushing attack was obviously very yeah. heavy early on. But I would absolutely love somebody like Jacoby Brissett because that would be more on the cheaper side, and you know you're getting a great individual. Very smart young man. He's going to work his butt off for you, and you could depend on him if your quarterback goes out for the season. I I would absolutely love that. This next question read from the Colonel. We have numerous offensive weapons. I was super disappointed in tight end and Curtis Samuel's usage. Super happy with Brian Robinson and AG, though. Did Scott Turner deserve another season? If you ask Curtis Samuel and Logan Thomas, it's (laughs) Yeah, I think it it was super interesting. Like early on in the season, the way Curtis Samuel was used was perfect. And then kind of seeing them, I don't know whether that's defenses. I mean, I haven't really watched much uh, since I with that in mind, but I don't know if that's defenses kind of catching up or what. But I just think with with the amount of unhappiness in the locker room, I mean, these, I just don't think you could have really brought him back. You could have really afforded to, you know, it was just like there's too much talent on this offense for it to just be stagnant. And I understand that the quarterback situation is tough and the, the way that the O line played, but you, you got to get a, a better offensive coordinator could have had uh, something kind of rolling with, the, with this because there's just too much talent. But yeah, yeah look, tight end was very disappointing as well, though, I will say. Look, I've seen many people say that Scott Turner was a scapegoat. And I've seen a lot of people who are, I respect in a high regard in the football world say that he was a scapegoat as well. I don't necessarily 100% believe that, to be perfectly honest. Jack Del Rio, they had a rash of injuries to corner. They had to let go of William Jackson the third. They are first on third down percentage, which is one of the worst that they in last year, end of the season. They're now first in the league at the end of the season. And points per game, they're seventh. They had a lot of injuries to linebacker. They had injuries to defensive line for Darian Mathis. They had to actually Chase pick Young up, missed just about the entire year. Exactly. They had to pick up John Ridgway, right? So I understand the argument of people saying, yeah, but the offensive line was terrible because of what Ron Rivera built. I get that. But on the other side of the football, if you look there, they're still excelling. They're still progressing. They're getting better even though they're hit by some – catastrophic injuries they're not at full strength but they're still getting better and progressing and then the other flip side of my argument here colonel is everyone i saw a lot of people in anthony armstrong on monday kind of talked about the locker room and ron rivera losing the locker room and that was a huge problem by going to carson wentz over taylor heineke a lot of people speculated on that and so that's probably a reason why ron rivera should be let go my whole thing is if nine anonymous players came out against ron rivera in this sort of setting we'd all be saying the same thing Ron probably should go. He lost the locker room. So in that breath, because that being said, because those players spoke up, you know they're not going to have the connection to the coach anymore, and you're just throwing you know noodles at the wall essentially by trying to keep this guy in there. And so I don't think he did. Look, I don't think he was the only reason, right? I don't think he was the reason why they took a step back this year. 24th in points per game, 21st in passing yards, 25th on third down, 25th in the red zone, and 26th in sacks. Obviously, that's not all because of Scott Turner. But the point is, he didn't make it any better. And that is probably the more. And then he lost the grip with the players. And that's probably the biggest separation. So I will say no, he didn't. Yeah, that was uh, going to kind of be my point is where um, you could probably say, like you said, that was it all Scott Turner's fault? Obviously not. Like the quarterback play has been bottom of the league for the past couple of years that he's been here. The offensive line was, like Sam said, probably bottom of the league, somewhere towards the bottom of the league in pass protection and just overall uh, this year, which also – People want, like, I know, obviously, Ron Rivera, and he should get the blame for it because he rebuilt the offensive line. He let guys like Eric Flowers go that could have probably been re-signed for cheap, and he brought in guys that he was familiar with. But Are we sure that Eric Flowers wanted to return to football? Well, I, mean, I think he just wanted honest more. here? No, no, like, I think he just wanted more money. They didn't want to pay him that. But he that's didn't, what he didn't play to. with anybody. And, like, that's know, the thing I think, is, like, I think he overvalued himself, and then people also were kind of just like, uh, he's a guard, even though guards are kind of getting more value nowadays because the interior line – and the push from the pocket is like a detriment to like quarterbacks and whatnot. But I just think that because the injuries they had for the past two years at the offensive line and you're plugging and playing guys that are like fourth, fifth string on the depth chart and the, uh, the offensive line coach, um, what's his name? Uh, Matsko. Matsko was making chicken salad out of chicken shit, basically. You know what I'm saying? With players just plugging and playing. So I Sometimes think that they thought, good. 
Yeah, so I thought <laughs> Love chicken shit. I think that this year they thought like, oh well, we've so been kind of getting out. we've been getting by with plug and play guys and just mediocre to subpar guys. And Matsko can do his thing again this year, and obviously it backfired. So I just think that overall, like you say, Kyle, is it all Scott Turner's fault? No, but did he make the situation better? And you can just look at the numbers, and the answer is no. So at the end of the day, and in any workplace, if you got nine of your coworkers complaining about you. I mean, nine times out of ten, you're probably going to get let go. So at the end of the day, they had to let Scott Turner go. Right. So, no, yeah. I don't think that it was his fault completely, but I do think that it was time for him to move on. Yeah, look, and, and it's not like he's the reason why they're all last in these categories, right, or bottom in the league in these categories. But my whole point is I'm not expecting them to be top five with the unit that they have, but I do expect progress from last season. Right. Exactly. And this is where they were last season. And that's that's the NFL. That happens all if you just don't – Somebody's got to get blamed for it. If it doesn't, if, if you, we have so much talent that the, the, they should have improved at least slightly, like you said. So, like, it's unfortunate it's got to fall on somebody, and that person's Scott Turner at this point. Yeah. So, I don't want to hear that he was a scapegoat anymore, to be perfectly yeah, honest. Because he's a human. He's not even a goat. That's dumb. <laughs> but, like, I understand what you mean by that, and you, there is some truth to it that he wasn't the whole reason, but it obviously got to a breaking point. So, by saying that it was a scapegoat, that would mean that he is – um, guiltless that he that he's innocent in a sense where he had a lot to do with putting himself and in that position right and so that's why also, I don't I don't like saying scapegoat and also you got to look at it like it's only it's going to fall on the doorstep of three different people Scott Turner the quarterback and Ron Rivera well obviously Ron Rivera is not going to step down or fire himself as the head coach so I'll eliminate him they're pretty much moving on from Carson Wentz and Taylor Heineke is probably going to be back or probably won't be back as well so they're getting ready of the quarterbacks. So the only person left to really to put the blame on and to move on would be Scott Turner. So it's kind of like you got to fall on your own sword, basically. Yeah, and it was really yeah. crazy to see the end of the season statistics. In nine games, Taylor Heineke had 62% completion percentage, 1,800 yards passing, 12 touchdowns, and six interceptions, averaged 206 yards per game. Carson Wentz is 62.3%, 1,955 yards, 11 touchdowns, and nine interceptions, averaged 219 yards per game, so only averaged 13 more yards than Taylor in one less game. So I thought that was very, very telling and crazy to look at. I thought that Carson's numbers would be a lot better. But now this next question is from Orange Crush 92 in our Discord chat server read. If anyone from the Burgundy Zone was to purchase a jersey from this year's performances, has to be different from players you already have a jersey of, who would it be and why? Yeah, so um originally I was leaning B Rob. Uh, however, I'm thinking, man, I just want to get a black cam curl jersey so bad. I don't have a cam curl jersey yet. Uh, I got the black cam, cam curl jersey upstairs. Yeah, dude, no, no, it, yeah, I know, but we're talking need, about me. You need it, yeah. dude. I'm telling right? you, it's, it's sick, right? Clean. Yours is awesome. Clean. Yeah, just the 31 in that looks so nice, and I, I'm so jealous of your jersey, and I, you know, I cry sometimes. But it, yeah, it, my, it's not, um, it's not stitched or anything like that. But it's more like the silky or uh, smooth type of jersey, yeah. dude. I'm telling you, it's it's beautiful. I was how clean does the camo look? It's IRL. good. It's good. Yeah. Really good. Uh, for me, if I because I already have Cam Curl, already have Terry McLaurin. My three guys I would love for this to honor for this season is obviously Terry, is obviously Cam Curl, and I already have their jerseys. So for me, the last one's Jonathan Allen. Um, I we got to talk to Jonathan Allen at the draft, kind of talk to about our expectations and stole everything. all of our souls. And he he did especially exactly, especially he did goals. exactly what this team needed him to do. Uh, he was the leader in the locker room, vocally and on the field. Seven and a half sacks on the year. Uh, he definitely deserves the jersey uh, resurgence for that. He did everything you could possibly need him to do from the defensive tackle standpoint. It's hard to be a leader as a defensive tackle because you can't, you're not there, you don't see everything behind you. But, he, dude, he answered that call, and he was a wrecking and a force. And uh, I, for no, no doubt about it, it's Jonathan Allen. He's a scary-ass dude. <laughs> well, a little backstory. I got a 2012 RG3 jersey, and then we see how that season ended with him being injured. Didn't buy another jersey for a while. Then all of a sudden... I get an Antonio Gibson jersey after his rookie year because that was my guy. Yeah. What happens his sophomore year? Fumble problems, injuries. Then I buy a Jahan Jahan Dotson jersey this year because I was like, he's going to be a baller. I just saw it. I knew he was going to be a beast. What happens this year? He gets injured. So I don't even know if I want to buy any more jerseys. <laughs> I don't want to keep jinxing it. But if I had to buy one, which I'm probably going to buy one, it's probably going to be a white one. It's going to be my guy Cam Curl. 
That freeze. No, you, you're good. Your yeah. video did. Your yeah, my video froze. Yeah, it's probably gonna be Cam Curl just because the dude's a baller. Like Coach Greg Curl, that's my guy. So yeah, and at the end of the day, you saw what the defense was with him and without him. So got to show love to a guy like Cam Curl. Hopefully they resign him because yeah. I don't want to buy the jersey and they don't resign him. I'll be pretty blown. Yeah. Now this next question is from Big Tony Shivers, and this is a great question. What qualities do you think make for a good offensive coordinator, Hall? Ooh, <clears throat> good, good, good question. Um, I would say a guy that can build the offense around his players' strengths yes, would be my number one first just key to a great offensive coordinator. A guy that caters to his players' strengths, caters to his quarterback's strengths. Um, a guy that is innovative and has like a, uh, Oh, your sound went out. So your video Aww. froze and then your sound. So we got to remember that for next time. Maybe that's a lead up to it. Uh, for me, Tony, the qualities I look for in a offensive corner is a, an attacking style. I thought that the way Scott Turner called games, it was almost like a defensive, not like actual defense, but it was more like I'm trying to protect myself more so than I'm going to press on your weaknesses and find out your issues and attack that. That's one of the things I really want in an offensive coordinator is attacking style and finding a way to get those weaknesses exposed. The other side is adaptable. Being able to juggle multiple things, adjusting, like one of the great Bruce Lee quotes, be water, right? And that's what you I want out of an offensive coordinator, somebody that can, in any environment, be able to adapt and be able to mold to what is happening in order for this team to be successful. Because once that defense figures out to put you in a corner and you can't get out of, they're going to try to do that as much as they possibly can, and that happened a lot this season. So attacking style and then adaptable. Yeah, and uh, kind of like Hall was, I think that the number one thing is not making guys fit into your system. We see that so many times that that fails. Like you really just got to go with your players and see what their best skill sets are, see what they like to do, see what they can do, see what they do well, and uh, really just being innovative. And, I mean, you don't even have to be innovative, like the types of plays that you're calling. It's just like with your route concepts, the way that you bunch players together, the way that you get guys open, just – Something because all these good teams that you see that are consistently good, they're they're off. I know that the quarterbacks are good, but like Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, these guys are always throwing to people that are just open. And I know that their arms are crazy, and a lot of times they do make unreal throws into tight windows. But like ninety percent of the time, it seems like these guys are just wide open for some reason. It's all about the concepts and stuff like that. So I'm excited to see the way that we go. But go ahead, I'll finish off strong. Last one I had is confident. Um, so attack, adaptable, and confident. Oh, that'd three. be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, like I was saying before, I froze again. Um, a guy that molds his offense to his player's strengths, to his quarterback's strengths. A guy that is that sees football like as far as like new age football, 2023 version of football where, like, again, you don't have to be like a run first team. You can pass the ball to open up the run. You can um, use screen plays and extent, as an extension of the run game, like QB or halfback little like slip outs and like out routes and just using the halfback like a, like Swiss Army knife type of thing. Um, like you said, a guy that's uh, adaptable to any type of situation. Like if you don't have like this is your strength and if they take it away like Bill Belichick style, what you're going to be your counter punch type of thing. And also, I would say lastly, a guy that can teach his offense to like make it like learnable to the to the players because like I know one of the things that players had a gripe with with Scott Turner was he wasn't really teaching the offense or he wasn't really explaining his offense really it wasn't really like a teachable offense to like his players and like they weren't really uh accepting his coaching I guess you could say because they, he like also said, didn't allow changes like he exactly, wouldn't allow exactly. you to adjust or audible at the line of scrimmage exactly, that sort so. of stuff yeah exactly exactly so a guy like like Kyle Shanahan a guy that can take a guy like Brock Purdy and just teach his offense to him and kind of just, hey, put it in layman's terms for him. Like, hey, this is blah, 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 X, Y, and Z. So um, obviously there's not many Kyle Shanahan's out right. there. There's, but, only, right. there's only one son of a former like, Super Bowl winning coach. A guy that can kind of teach it in that way where it's like it's learnable for like a guy that's a seventh round pick as well as a first round pick. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. that would be uh, my – attributes yeah now this next question is from tim towner in the discord chat server the name human one... genius yes he is the <laughs> human genius name one positive from this past season that regardless of the sale or the staff changes should give us hope for next season uh, playmakers man you look at the offense like i know defense they've been fantastic but offense like this if they're not too far off and if they get the right oc or some o-line guys or a quarterback whatever like they're gonna have a field like 
throwing the ball to Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel, handing it off to Brian Robinson, Antonio Gibson, like not, not many teams could say that. So I think you got to feel really good about the playmakers on offense. Um, For me. So I know a lot of people went on Ron Rivera about his comment about taking the next step, right? And how earlier in the season, he said that it's about taking the next step. And a lot of people has been pressing on that. But one thing, one issue I've always had with Washington is like when we lost, it was like an embarrassing loss. We just could not be in the game. We looked like an embarrassment. And that ha- and I, I feel like in that breath, the team has taken a step forward because they don't lay down. I mean, you could say the 49ers, but like the 49ers are literally playing fantastic football right, right now. Even and, the Lions, when they got destroyed, they came back. Right. I mean, they were... And so, like, they, this team continues to fight in every game. So I don't want to say that they took a, a step in success, but they took they took a step in success of a team, meaning, like, the mental hurdle of knowing that we are always in it. And it more so, that's something that could be viewed as a positive because if you add a quarterback or have the confidence with Sam Howell to be that guy to say we can come back in anything, we believe in that confidence, that's a dangerous thing for a team to have. To know that it doesn't matter what happens, we always have a chance to come back. That's one of the things that the Nats uh, um, World Series team had. It didn't matter how much they got down. They knew that if in those last three innings, seven through nine, they had a chance to come back. They just needed somebody to hold, uh, control the bleeding a little bit. And that's something that I find as a positive heading into next season that this team just does not quit. They really do fight. What about you, Hall? Um, I would say that was perfect timing because I froze again. Um, I was about to say it was like you didn't start talking. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> I would say uh, the amount of young players that were um, on the field for us this year and had to come in because of injuries, forced to play because whatever reason – and we're successful on the field, and there's building blocks going forward with those younger players. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited that if they can get this interior of the offensive line or just the offensive line as a whole rebuilt and back to the 2020-2021 style and standard, then I'm excited for the offense because, I mean, even if it's just uh, Sam Howell or Jimmy G or Jacoby Brissett, whoever you want to throw back there, if you give a quarterback time in the NFL – Nine times out of ten, he's going to hit his receiver. He's going to hit somebody. So, yeah, I'm just excited for the young players that we have, excited for the building blocks going forward with the young players, and I'm excited that if they get the offensive line sewed up and even the quarterback sewed up, this team has through-the-roof potential with all the playmakers on both sides of the ball. Agreed. Now this next question is from Brandon Reinbold, Mies21 in the Discord chat server. Read, how realistic is Eric Bieniemy as a candidate for OC – he has ties to Ron Rivera and doesn't call plays at Kansas City. But other than that, would he even want to come here? And what direction do you prefer to go to hire OC? Um, it's tough to say with Eric Bieniemy. I know Eric Bieniemy has had his issues with players like with Sean McCoy, Patrick Mahomes, and stuff. Don't like him. So that that's worrisome. Um, at the same time, that you can't argue the dude's success. But would he come here? I don't know. What Hall is his contract up or something after this year? Yes, is that what it I is? Think this, uh, I was reading uh, Benjamin okay. Albright was saying that his contract is up. So uh, it's not like a 100% thing that he's going to leave. They could hire him back in Kansas City, obviously. But, right. yeah, I think that uh, if I'm Eric Bieniemy, I'd be looking to expand somewhere else, maybe take a lateral move as an offensive coordinator, maybe even to a team like Washington, because the positives would be if you turn around a bottom of the league offense to a even just mid-level average top 15, 16, 17 offense, that's only going to look better for your resumes as far as like you're getting interview jobs, but no one wants to hire you as a head coach. Well, if you turn around an offense at the bottom of the league, take them up in points, take them up in red zone percentage uh, and whatnot, take them up to top 16 in the league, top 15 in the league, I think that'll open more people's eyes to, okay, well, a lot of the talk is he wasn't really calling the plays in Kansas City. He wasn't really the quarterback's coach in Kansas City. Like, what does he really do in Kansas City? And that will prove to people that, okay, he can call plays, he can coach guys up, and he can be successful in this league without Andy Reid and Mahomes. So I think it would be a good move for him to come here. But, again, there's probably going to be other options on the table if he takes a lateral move or he could take a college uh, job as well, go down to college, coach some college guys up, dominate the college level, and then come back to the NFL as a head coach. So I'm sure he'll have a lot of options, but – I mean, I would love Eric Bandy to be here because that's a guy that has an innovative offense and is forward thinking in his offense. Yeah. And uh, on top of all that, that with like the direction that I would want to go, I, I 
said I, I like Joe or Joe Brady. I think he's interesting. It's also Daryl Bevel down in Miami. Some of these, one of these, we're not probably going to get a good team's offensive coordinator, but if we can pick from a good team, somebody who has had success in the past or somebody who kind of is considered, who's been around winning football, I think that that's kind of the direction that you want to go. I don't want to go out there and hire a Carolina offensive coordinator. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I, like on, what's going on here? Too. I do like Pepe. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's crazy too, because I mean, he was on Houston, that staff's gone, but he's very interesting. He's considered a good young mind in the NFL. So uh, these, uh, I'd be very interested in him. Yeah, I do think it is relatively realistic, Brandon. I don't think it's crazy to think that Brandon, um, that the enemy could come here because simply because of the contract, right? Like maybe Kansas City kind of wants to let this natural thing run its course. And, and Eric, the enemy from a standpoint, well, maybe I won't be an OC for another team. I'm maybe not getting a head coaching job. Maybe I will go over to Washington with those He's interviewed weapons. for head coaching jobs like the last three years. Right. And so maybe that is the case because, like you guys said, it's it's hard for an OC to leave a, a good situation laterally. Doesn't make sense. But the reason why it's not realistic is because the OC coming here knows that most likely there will be a turnover here in the near future. And so in what capacity would the new owner say, I'm looking at that OC as a possible head coaching guy? And I feel like that is another aspect here that has to go into it where is the OC taking it thinking that he can be the head coach? And then you have to get the okay from the possible new owner. Is that the guy that you want? And I feel like that is a rabbit hole that's going to take a while and that that makes it unrealistic. But because of the contract, that does add an interesting layer to it, I will say. Yeah. Now, if you can put on your resume, I turned Washington around. That's probably a good resume builder. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. You're you're right. And now that that was a really good one. Now, what direction would I prefer? Honestly, I don't really know all that much about these guys because it's hard to be able to go in and see who's calling plays, whose plays what, what did he dry, draw up, what did, what can he do with this offense? Um, I trust them to be able to get it done. The issue being is, can we get it done? And because of the situation that's happening here. And I do think it is very, very tricky, but I hope that the, whoever they do bring in here has a plan. Bring that's all Jay I want. Gruden. Yeah. No, what? No. <laughs> what? Joking. I will God, say, Jay on, Gruden, man. offensive coordinator, greater than Simon. Jay Gruden, offensive coordinator, Jay Gruden, Fox. head coach. That guy gets it. Just yeah. saying. Hey, man. He was putting up numbers and yards when he was here. Like I said on Twitter, Mike, I was Shanahan, joking, though. Mike Shanahan built it, Jay Gruden got credit for it, and Bruce Allen destroyed it. Okay. That's all I'm going to say because if Jay Gruden was any good, he'd be in the NFL right now in some capacity, even he as is. a quarterback. He's a coach. consultant. He's a consultant for well, the Rams. I mean, like, actually yeah. on a staff. He's not. He's in Ashburn going golfing, you know, and going on radio yeah. shows and Living podcasts. Yeah, golfing hell, yeah. and consulting and going right. on the radio. Well, yeah. yeah. I'm talking about I know, the staff. I'm joking, man. I'm joking. I know. I just hate that because he just gets so much run around here. And I, like, I was, I was going to make it's a like, joke. It's like, dude, Jay, Jay used to – the media used to shit on Jay so bad, and now when he's back, it's all Jay. They all well, love they, him from Jay. They love Jay because Jay gave them a lot. And no, I know. Jay it's just so funny how much – they used to make fun of him so hard, all the media oh, yeah. around here. Oh, the guys are so playing. The, the playing. Chris like, Russell they're, was they're the biggest now. one. The club Jay, club Jay. Now he has him on the radio at like once yeah, a week. It's just right. weird. Yeah. And that, I was well, going to make a joke today. I was going to make a joke on Twitter today. Like, oh, man, I can't wait to see Scott Turner come back onto to weekly podcast radio shows here in Washington because apparently we love to do that. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. You know, real fast, I heard that they call Chris Russell Rooster because that's what he consumes for each meal. <laughs> oh, my God. I heard he, like, wears trench coats and stuff, which is really funny. Like, that, that, that totally makes seems sense. like Chris It's the Russell. only kind of coat that'll fit. <laughs> Oh my god! Why are you it looks that? like a regular it's coat. So mean, dude. <laughs> it just looks like a normal coat on him. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's gonna wrap us up for this episode. He's a nice guy. We'll Chris see you guys cool. next week. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great, safe weekend. Uh, please sh like and share uh, the podcast. Uh, we would love to be able to have you guys subscribe to the channel so you can get updates on when we upload stuff. And then also give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Pod, whatever you're listening to this on. We'd really appreciate you guys to give us a review um, because uh, in our Discord, we'd like to ask, what, what would you like to see more? How can we make it more entertaining? And uh, honestly, regardless of how bad it could be in your suggestions i want to hear it because that's yeah. only going to help us really and yeah like if you want us to take our shirts off for every episode like i've been telling kyle we, we should keep do. suggesting it every episode <laughs> and i'm telling you guys i'm not sure if it's going to happen i'm not sure how long i can hold back this fire but we'll see all right everybody we'll see you on monday have a great weekend i'm kyle i'm whole yeah jay gruden man jay gruden's third brother below that, that's Gard. my name i love b
All right, oh, everybody. Man, we'll see you on Monday. Man. Washington Holy football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Hey!